Greetings, everyone. It's staticky now on your sawu. Yes, that was an earlier comment I had made. It looked like it kind of repeated itself. It's sassy now on your Okay, it's less staticky. Nope, I can't hear you. Okay, it's less data key. How about now? Connie think... says that it's still static key. Yeah, it's my computer, but can't really help that, but it'll stop when the movie starts. And then am I, uh, can folks hear me on the stream? Yay, yay! Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you, Jajorian. Y'all helped us out quite a bit. We appreciate you. Thank y'all for your patience. Um, we are learning all kinds of new technologies and platforms to be able to still like build with y'all uh, in this wild time of pandemics. And so we appreciate your assistance as we work out the kinks. But my name is Onya Sanwu. This is my comrade, Monika. We are both members of the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party New Mexico chapter. And this is our monthly Pan-African film series. We do this film series on the second Saturday of every single month. We used to do it at Highland High School. We now do it virtually on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And the purpose of this film series is to show y'all revolutionary African and anti-colonial films and provide y'all with some revolutionary Pan-African analysis of those films and also provide a space for us to learn and discuss them collectively. So this is a way for us to like share our world view with you and for y'all to like build with us. And so we deeply appreciate your participation um, and your comments and your helping us work out technical glitches. And definitely please keep commenting if you have any issues seeing or hearing me or Monica or the film. Anything you wanna add, Monica? I know, that's great. Hey from NYC, Darren, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hey Santos, hey Tonya, hey Connie. Okay, so today's film, actually let me start off um, with some historical events that happened today that are very, very important to us as an organization, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, but also to the global struggle for African liberation. So today is the born day of Emmy Call Cabral, who is a brilliant African revolutionary who helped build the struggle against Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau that was successful. The African people in Guinea-Bissau overthrew the Portuguese and installed their own socialist state that exists to this day. So Emmanuel Cabral was born today. We want to lift him up. And then also at the same time, it's a day of like great tragedy for the movement because Steve Biko of the Black Consciousness Movement in Azania, also known as South Africa, was murdered by police in South Africa today. So we have both the birth of this incredible African revolutionary, Amical Cabral, who not only helped lead Guinea-Bissau to independence from Portuguese colonialism, but also gave us like theories and ideological frameworks that we use to this day to build the APRP. But it's also the day of the passing of a great anti-colonial African revolutionary, Steve Biko, who was murdered by the apartheid government in South Africa for the crime of attempting to regain the land of his people to regain, reclaim the land that was stolen from indigenous Africans in Zambia. He fought for them to develop a national liberation movement 
And in response, the apartheid government in South Africa murdered him. So we want to lift up both of these examples of great revolutionary African men today and bring them into the space. And then the movie that we're going to be discussing today is another movie about a revolutionary African, a revolutionary African man, a revolutionary African leader, also one of the people who founded the African People's Revolutionary Party. That man is Kwame Nkrumah. If you don't know who Kwame Nkrumah is, he was the first democratically elected president of the first country to gain independence from colonialism in Africa. Uh, that country was Ghana. And when Kwame Nkrumah was elected president of Ghana, on the day of Ghana's independence, he said, the independence of Ghana is meaningless without the total liberation of Africa and of all African people. Kwame Nkrumah put forth a modern framework for Pan-Africanism that he built alongside people like Emekal Cabral, people like Sekou Toure, um, to liberate the continent. He laid out a vision, starting from Ghana, to liberate the continent. And so this movie is going to talk about his life, about how he became a Pan-Africanist, about why he decided to form the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and why he was considered such a threat to the U.S. and to the powers of Western imperialism. So it's about 40 minutes long. We have a brief video before the movie to set some context about Pan-Africanism. And then after the movie is over, we're going to have a group discussion. If you registered for the Zoom discussion, we're going to let you in at 3 o'clock to join us on video to discuss the film. If you have not registered for the Zoom discussion, you can still participate via the comments of the stream on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So either way, after the movie, please stick around, whether that's in Zoom or whether that's on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, for a discussion of what we just saw. So without further ado, I'm going to transition to the movie and get it started. Thanks, y'all. Freedom! 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 Kwame yeah. Nkrumah was a vicious colonial subjects and the colonial powers so that ordinary African people could organize for their independence. At long last, the battle has ended. He had a vision, he had a dream about Ghana. He broke with the past of bourgeois, uh, gradualist, nationalist politicians. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate all the territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it's the length of the total reflection of the African continent. Kwame Nkrumah was the greatest pan-Africanist and socialist revolutionary organizer that the African world has seen and if the masses of the people pick up on his ideas, Africa will be free. Kwame Kumar was born 21st September 1909 in a town called Ngrofu in the western region of Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah grew up in a colony ruled by the British. There was a governor general and there was a legislative council dominated by colonial commercial interests. The country existed for the export of raw materials that would serve the industries and economies of the European nations. He was born to parents who were not particularly endowed in terms of their wealth. The father was a goldsmith and the mother was a petty trader. He is slightly difficult to pin down. He's, he's an Inzema. His dad comes from the Ivory Coast. His mother comes from just the right side of the Ghanaian border. So he's genuinely on the periphery in ethnic terms. He's on the periphery in class terms. He's on the periphery in that he's Catholic. Experiences of a child growing up in a family such as this one in the colonial era where the exploitation, the vast exploitation was done by capitalists from the, the metropolis and where citizens were looked down upon in their own surroundings must have affected him very greatly. 
His mother, Nayaniba, who he was particularly very close to, um, was very keen um, for Nkrumah to receive an education. He also grew up at a time when um, the Christian churches were trying to make headway there. Almost all the schools that you could attend at that time, and I'm talking of primary schools that were in the beginning, no high schools, were church run. Nkrumah was a highly affable young man with both his peers and his tutors. However, he was a very serious student. He was very studious, diligent, had a voracious love of, of reading. And one of his contemporaries by the name of Beverly Carter said that he always used to remember Nkrumah um, forever reading, engaging in philosophy and debating with um, fellow colleagues. He was hungry for knowledge, he was searching for knowledge, he was desperately in search of, of knowledge which was necessary at the time if we were to combat the negative effect of colonialism and racism. Within the, the, the Gold Coast and generally West Africa, um, from the latter quarter of the 19th century, the minority of educated West Africans were pushing and mobilizing, galvanizing for political independence. I think that Kwame Nkrumah was influenced by a number of very important people as he was growing up in, in Ghana. There were people like James Iman Kwejir Agri. Nkrumah says of him in his autobiography that he was a most remarkable man, a man with, um, who possessed um, intense vitality and enthusiasm. And it was through Agri, Nkrumah narrates in his autobiography, that his nationalism was aroused. In a way, Agri mirrored you know, the kind of person Nkrumah wanted to be. He often said, I represent Africa. I've never heard of Agri saying, I represent the Gold Coast. He always said, I represent Africa. Even though Nkrumah was not taught formally by Agri, he used to visit Agri at church and listen to his Sunday evening sermons. And it was through his sermons that Nkrumah was profoundly inspired in terms of his commitment and convictions towards Pan-Africanism. The last person was Namdi Azikwe, popularly and affectionately referred to as Zik. He's one of Nigeria's great nationalists and he was a publisher. He had been a graduate of Lincoln and as a result um, influenced Nkrumah to go and study abroad. The challenge for Nkrumah to get to the United States of America was basically mainly financial. He didn't have the money. He stowed away on a boat to get to a relative in Nigeria who was quite wealthy because he thought the relative would help. That entailed many risks. Of course, when stowaways are discovered on ships, they kill them and throw them overboard. So it was a big risk that he took. The relative paid for him to go back to the Gold Coast to pick up all his gear and to make final arrangements, paid for him to come to England and paid for his passage to America. The social climate and atmosphere in America during the 40s was just like apartheid in South Africa. Complete and total segregation. He came face to face with the reality of racist oppression. He came face to face with how capitalism exploited even people in the metropolis. Nkrumah went to an all-African school in Pennsylvania, Lincoln University. As a student in America, Kwame Nkrumah faced many hardships. There was a point when Kwame Nkrumah didn't have any place to sleep. He used to sleep in the park and he used to eat leftovers. Kwame Nkrumah slept in different people's houses. He washed dishes. He scrubbed floors, you know, to eat, to have a place to live and study. And that's, that's how he moved about. That's how he moved about. His, his life was very hard. He's working one job and going to two different schools at the same time. But I think the positive of it was that it put him in contact with the African community in the United States who were oppressed. He had an opportunity to do a survey where he was able to go from house to house and learn from the direct. Freedom! 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 
Freedom! Kwame Nkrumah was a visionary, a revolutionary, and a pathbreaker. He dared to challenge colonial subjects and the colonial powers so that ordinary African people could organize for their independence. At long last, the battle has ended. He had a vision, he had a dream about Ghana. He broke with the past of bourgeois, uh, gradualist, nationalist politicians. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate all the territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it links up the total reflection of the African continent. Kwame Nkrumah was the greatest pan-Africanist and socialist revolutionary organizer that the African world has seen. And if the masses of the people pick up on his ideas, Africa will be free. Kwame Kumar was born 21st September 1909 in a town called Ngrofol in the western region of Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah grew up in a colony ruled by the British. There was a governor general and there was a legislative council dominated by colonial commercial interests. The country existed for the export of raw materials that would serve the industries and economies of European nations. He was born to parents who were not particularly endowed in terms of their wealth. The father was a goldsmith and the mother was a petty trader. He is slightly difficult to pin down. He's, he's an Nzema. His dad comes from the Ivory Coast. His mother comes from just the right side of the Ghanaian border. So he's genuinely on the periphery in ethnic terms. He's on the periphery in class terms. He's on the periphery in that he's Catholic. Experiences of a child growing up in a family such as this one in the colonial era where the exploitation, the vast exploitation was done by capitalists from the, the metropolis and where citizens were looked down upon in their own surroundings must have affected him very greatly. His mother, Nayaniba, who he was particularly very close to, um, was very keen um, for Nkrumah to receive an education. He also grew up at a time when um, the Christian churches were trying to make headway there. Almost all the schools that you could attend at that time, and I'm talking of primary schools that were in the beginning, no high schools, were church run. Nkrumah was a highly affable young man with both his peers and his tutors. However, he was a very serious student. He was very studious, diligent, had a voracious love of, of reading. And one of his contemporaries by the name of Beverly Carter said that he always used to remember Nkrumah um, forever reading, engaging in philosophy and debating with um, fellow colleagues. He was hungry for knowledge, he was searching for knowledge, he was desperately in search of, of knowledge which was necessary at the time if we were to combat the negative effect of colonialism and racism. Within the, the, the Gold Coast and generally West Africa, um, from the latter quarter of the 19th century, the minority of educated West Africans were pushing and mobilizing, galvanizing for political independence. I think that Kwame Nkrumah was influenced by a number of very important people as he was growing up in, in Ghana. There were people like James Iman Kwejir Agri, Nkrumah says of him in his autobiography that he was a most remarkable man, a man with, um, who possessed um, intense vitality and enthusiasm. And it was through Agri, Nkrumah narrates in his autobiography, that his nationalism was aroused. In a way, Agri mirrored you know, the kind of person Nkrumah wanted to be. He often said, 
I represent Africa. I've never heard of Agri saying, I represent the Gold Coast. He always said, I represent Africa. Even though Nkrumah was not taught formally by Agri, he used to visit Agri at church and listen to his Sunday evening sermons. And it was through his sermons that Nkrumah was profoundly inspired in terms of his commitment and convictions towards Pan-Africanism. The last person was Namdi Azikwe, popularly and affectionately referred to as Zeke. He's one of Nigeria's great nationalists and he was a publisher. He had been a graduate of Lincoln and as a result um, influenced Nkrumah to go and The challenge for Nkrumah to get to the United States of America was basically mainly financial. He didn't have the money. He stowed away on a boat to get to a relative in Nigeria who was quite wealthy because he thought the relative would help. That entailed many risks. Of course, when stowaways are discovered on ships, they kill them and throw them overboard. So it was a big risk that he took. The relative paid for him to go back to the Gold Coast to pick up all his gear and to make final arrangements, paid for him to come to England and paid for his passage to America. The social climate and atmosphere in America during the 40s was just like apartheid in South Africa. Complete and total segregation. He came face to face with the reality of racist oppression. He came face to face with how capitalism exploited even people in the metropolis. Nkrumah went to an all-African school in Pennsylvania, Lincoln, University. As a student in America, Kwame Nkrumah faced many hardships. There was a point when Kwame Nkrumah didn't have any place to sleep. He used to sleep in the park, he used to eat leftovers. Kwame Nkrumah slept in different people's houses, he washed dishes, he scrubbed up floors, you know, to eat, to have a place to live and study. And that's, that's how he moved about. That's how he moved about. His, his life was very hard. He's working one job and going to two different schools at the same time. But I think the positive of it was that it put him in contact with the African community in the United States who were oppressed. He had an opportunity to do a survey where he was able to go from house to house and learn from the direct experience of the African people. Kwame Nkrumah went to school to prepare himself for a great struggle ahead. He knew he was very conscious of why he was there. And this, I think, sets him apart from a lot of students that had been there. He did enormous amount of reading um, in his own time. Um, and some of the thinkers that he came across and he remarks in his autobiography are individuals such as Descartes, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Marx, and of course, the key influential person he mentions that had a major influence upon him was Marcus Garvey. Nkrumah was to say that we prefer self-government in danger to servitude in tranquility. And I believe it is these influences of people like Garvey that informed such statements. Marcus Garvey had the largest Pan-African organization past or present. And his slogan was simple, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. Kwame Nkrumah made it very clear that the Honorable Marcus Garvey was one of the main persons who actually, you know, raised his consciousness when he read the book, Philosophy and Opinion of Marcus Garvey. Um, that ignited his Pan-Africanism and his commitment to the African continent. Pan-Africanism, properly defined, is the total liberation and unification of Africa under an all-African socialist government. Pan-Africanism was a movement, a movement which arose out of Africa's unequal and unfair relationship with the rest of the world. Because at that time, every square inch of Africa, except for Ethiopia, was under direct colonial rule. Pan-Africanism is an ideology which unites the African people wherever they may be 
in the struggle for their liberation from exploitation and oppression. The first four Pan-Africanist Congresses were held in uh, the U.S. and in Europe and were not attended by Africans born on the continent. So this is what Kwame Nkrumah experienced, you know, during his time in the U.S. When he was not in school, he was busy moving about the United States, working with local organization, the national organization like the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He participated in many debates uh, in Harlem about Pan-Africanism. Attending Garveyite meetings, attending meetings across the ideological spectrum within American politics as well. And Krumer formed his own organization while he was in the United States which then published a newspaper called The African Interpreter. And that was talking about the need for African unity. He came in contact with a man by the name of C. L. R. James, who was a brother born in Trinidad. He was a revolutionary who followed the socialist ideas of Leon Trotsky, who at least defended the uh, liberation of Africa, the liberation of all the world with socialism. In the 1930s, he hasn't got his driving license yet. He's a young man, an experienced man in the United States. He's meeting some of the right people. He's going to the right meetings, he's reading the right books for an active career in, in anti-colonial politics. And he hits, uh, he hits the ground running in, in, in the early 1940s when he arrives in Britain. Nkrumah came to London um, from 1945 and stayed here till 1947. Uh, awful London. I mean, a London where the lights went out all the time because of uh, power outages, uh, people were cold. These are Africans living in London where there's no real heating. It's before the, the days of central heating. Uh, one, one burner gas cookers in the rooms. Uh, rationing, of course, still going on. Um, being wet and cold the whole time. And Krumah decided to come to England it is CLR who introduced him to George Padmore. He knew everybody who was politically active anywhere at all, absolutely everybody. And of course this became quite important when M. Krumer got involved with him because M. Padmore could introduce him to everybody. He contributed a lot towards Nkrumah's vision of Pan-Africanism in particular. And Nkrumah, in his years in the United States and in Britain, was under surveillance. Why would the CIA have had him under surveillance? Well, he was a black man talking about the need for racial equality and against imperialism, which would not have gone unnoticed by the CIA. Padmore, Du Bois and others were in the forefront also of the anti-colonial struggle and they were also in the forefront of the struggle for socialism for newly emergent nations in Africa. So when Nkrumah comes here, he is under surveillance. I would imagine from the time he spoke at the Manchester Pan-African Conference in 1945, I think everybody who spoke there was under surveillance. In 1945, there was Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester, England, and the significance of this particular Congress is that you had representatives from the African continent there. A significant historical gathering of West Indians and Africans um, who came from all over the colonial world um, over 200 delegates were represented at the Congress and they demanded an end to colonial rule. It was co-chaired by Kwame Nkrumah, Dr. W.B. Du Bois and George Padmore. Pan-Africanism really only began to talk about colonial freedom at this conference. There were Pan-African conferences before but mostly they were focused on racial inequalities. They didn't say we want independence now. Indeed, the final resolution of the Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester declared that Africans needed to struggle against colonialism and to establish newly independent states under the banner of socialism. The people of the Gokos were not ruling themselves. They had representatives of 
the Queen of uh, England, ruling through a governor. I mean, that was direct colonial rule. I mean, there was no significant infrastructure. The only infrastructure that was here was, of course, roads from the mines, you know, to the port. Nkrumah returned to the Gold Coast in 1947 as a result of an invitation by the United Gold Coast Convention, otherwise known as the UGCC, to take up the appointment as secretary for this new organization. This has been noted as a, a young, clever young man. And he's invited back to be the gopher for the United Gold Coast Convention, which in many senses is the first political party in, in Ghana. He was quite suspicious of the leadership of the United Gold Coast Convention because this leadership was made up of um, representatives of the privileged classes and Nkrumah doubted their commitments to what he would consider to be independence. He found them amateurish. He compared with what he had seen in terms of political organization in London. He found them uh, undirected, that they were part-time politicians. They were more interested in making money uh, than in politics. Uh, they had personal reasons for being political. Well, here again, it's, it's important to recognize that the colonialists had deliberately created an African class who believed in the ideology and believed in the colonial enterprise. This African elite class was interested in ending colonialism, but ending colonialism only to the extent that they assumed the power of the colonialists and continued to maintain the colonial structures. He builds a party within the party of trusted people uh, who have uh, links with all the other units of disaffection in, in, in the Gold Coast, the so-called voluntary associations, and these are all sorts of scholars' unions, market women's associations, and he builds links with them, and that's very brilliantly done. As Nkrumah was talking about uh, independence now, the opposing forces were saying, no, we don't need that now. We should struggle for independence at some, at, at some future date. The youth and the grassroots identified with Nkrumah was the privileged classes were trying to just hold them back and also trying to get Nkrumah to, to tone down. He then challenges the involvement of United Gold Coast Convention politicians with the Commission of Inquiry into the riots of, of uh, February 1948, the Watson Commission, and the, particularly their involvement in the, the, the Kusi Committee that drafts the new constitution. Their involvement in that is a death knell for them. They're involved with the colonial state in making another colonial constitution. And he denounces them, and he's in a perfect position to do that. He does it very, very cleverly. The pressure from the youth and the grassroots was said that in 1949, Nkrumah broke away from the United Gold Coast Convention and set up the Convention People's Party. On June 12, 1949, he formally launched the Convention People's Party at West End Arena, Accra here. And the party was formed and was born. And all of us registered at me. And right away, of course, there was, uh, there was antagonism on the side of the UGCC, aligning themselves with Europe, while Kwame Nkrumah was aligning himself with the masses of the people in Ghana. The Convention People's Party, or CPP, was created as a vehicle to bring emancipation to the local people of the Gold Coast at that time. No oppressor abandons oppression as a gift to the oppressed. I have not heard of it anywhere in the world. Colonialism is not a tea party. Colonialism is tough. Colonialism is wicked. And colonialism is oppression. And so when you want to get yourself out of this, it's a struggle. You can't get out of it just by passing resolutions and smiling, making good speeches. You have to fight and you have to remove the oppressor. And if you don't fight to remove the oppressor, the oppressor will even recruit people internally and they'll continue acting on behalf of the oppressor throughout. The campaign for positive action that Nkrumah's Convention People's Party pursued um, was a strategy very much influenced by Gandhian philosophy and principles. It was a strategy of non-violence and civil disobedience. While Nkrumah was calling for positive action, you know, the strikes, 
uh, the demonstrations and stuff. The other people were calling him a troublemaker and a rabble rouser. Which then gives the colonial state the excuse for banging up lots of people for inciting an illegal strike. He's banged up. And of course, it's absolutely perfect that he's banged up as, a, as his first period of martyrdom. Nkrumah spent 14 months in James Fort Prison in Accra. And he plays this to the limit, and he knows enough about Gandhi and, and so on to know this is a clever, a clever and a useful thing to do. Meanwhile, the work of the party, which has already been put in train as a, a well-oiled machine, is going on outside. He wrote letters that he wrote on toilet paper that were smuggled out of the prison and carried to his right-hand lieutenant, Komla Gebedema. The legislation at that time did not prevent him from contesting as a parliamentary candidate. And it became clear at a point in time when the colonial government agreed that constitutional rule for Ghana was going to begin, that Nkrumah was also going to stand. And it then comes to the first general election that Ghana has ever had in, in 1951, which is contested by his political party, the Convention of People's Party, although he's still in the nick. He stands for across Central and overwhelmingly wins the seat. England was forced to allow there to be a referendum of independence of staying with colonial rule, in, and the CPP won landslide victory. And under that pressure, he's released by, by, by the governor. And because the Convention People's Party won more seats than anybody else, they're asked to, fa to form the first African government in the Gold Coast, along with colonial officials. The election was met with enthusiasm and excitement everywhere, everywhere in the African world. I mean, Ghana had become now the black star of the world. I mean, everybody looked to Ghana. The British were very clever about it. He should have been prime minister, but they decided you know, for their own purposes, that he shouldn't be prime minister, but leader of government business. And the British come out of this thinking he's a really good guy, and this is a really smart party that compared with all the other guys who'd been political leaders before, this guy delivers the good. He's a good politician. He's not just a politician, such a statesman. It is my earnest and confident belief that my people in Ghana will go forward in freedom and justice in unity among themselves. On the 6th of March 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became Ghana's first Prime Minister of an independent state. The Gold Coast now became Ghana. Ghana was the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to obtain independence. And so therefore he was an inspiration to an entire continent to arise and seek their own freedom from the shackles of colonialism. At long last, the battle has ended. Your beloved country is free forever. Kwame Nkrumah became Ghana's first prime minister of an independent state. The Gold Coast now became Ghana. We were very, very proud, you know, because for the first time we had a Ghanaian in charge of Ghana. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing all of us. To symbolize that the Gold Coast was now an independent country, Kwame Nkrumah and his Convention People's Government decided to change the name from the Gold Coast to the historically ancient name of Ghana. Ancient Ghana, um, going back as far back as the 5th century, was an ancient kingdom in West Africa 
and therefore Nkrumah and the CPP decided to revert back to this historic name. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah became known later as Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And Osajifu in the Akan language of Ghana means savior. But he was also known as Showboy and uh, had another series of nicknames to indicate the extent of his charisma, which was electric. His, his slogan was, thought without action is empty, and action without thought is blind, so that we need men and women who think like men and women of action and act like men and women of thought. The tax then was to begin to build a new nation, united nation, a nation in which its people saw themselves first and foremost as Ghanaians, rather than as Shantis and Elwes and Dagombas and so on. So that was the tax. The primary tax was to build a new united Ghana with a distinct Ghanaian identity. The challenges that Nkrumah faces start well before independence. In 1954, the Minister of Finance, was Kamala Bedema, stands up and presents a paper to the cabinet saying uh, the cocoa price is going to go down, that basically chocolate makers worldwide are overstocked, the price of chocolate's going to go down, there's no market growth predictable in future. And the conclusions drawn in cabinet then are what we want to do in terms of social change, advancing the need for education for all, health service, building a deep water port at Tema, uh, improving the infrastructure so that the supply of uh, farm produce to towns and so on can be enhanced and so on. We're going to have to do that fast. So they spend like uh, drunken sailors. Some of the industrialization projects he carried out were the building of roads, then his various schools and hospitals. He poured a great deal of money into education. In a relatively short period of about six years, educational institutions have been built in all the districts of Ghana that introduce fee-free and compulsory education for every Ghanaian child. For all students, both girls and boys, from primary school to higher education. They're using up reserves because it's not going to last. They know that the, there are bad times coming. So that is the fundamental challenge, that if you want to reconstruct a state, if you want to make a modern state, if you want to industrialize a state, and so on, you need cash. There's no serious outside investment at the time. There's a lot of bent outside investment at the time, which is another story. But he, he, the challenge he faces basically is a decline in government revenue. And it's fundamentally a government revenue-based development project that, that he's on about with the first two five-year plans. The construction of the hydroelectric project in Akosombo was key to the industrialization of Ghana. With declining state revenues, with an increasingly hostile Western world, but I think also an indifferent Eastern world, Russians always talk about supporting him, but in terms of what actually turns up on the doorstep in terms of cash or things, not very much to show for it. He has gone to the US to raise funds for the construction of the Akosombo Dam. The U.S. didn't want to support, and they were dragging their feet. So he reluctantly had to make a move to the Soviet Union to support. And that was when, when America decided that it's, you know, Kaiser. You have to remember, in the world, there was sort of East versus the West. We were involved in what they called the Cold War, you know, communism versus capitalism. Africa was caught in the middle. All the countries that had become liberated and were fighting for their freedom were vying for that country to be in either the Western camp or the Eastern camp. Kwame Nkrumah and the parliament decided that they must be non-aligned. They were not supporting the West against the East, nor the East against the West, but they were moving forward toward Pan-Africanism. Nkrumah's vision for Ghana was very much a microcosm of his vision for the entire African continent. On the eve of Ghana's independence, Nkrumah made a statement that the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate all the territories in Africa, our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent.
And so it was, Vice President, that from the very first day of her independence, Ghana served as a rear base for the total liberation of our continent. Nkrumah gave practical expression to this declaration by first of all organizing the All African People's Conference of 1958, at which all the liberation movements in Africa participated and formulated strategies for overthrowing colonialism. Nkrumah gave enormous logistical and practical support to various liberation movements such as Patrice Lumumba of the Congo, Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau, and Kenneth Kaunda of present-day Zambia, and many others. He invited George Pratmore to serve as his advisor for African Affairs. And he also invited the man who had been the president of the five Pan-African Congress, the first Pan-Africanist Congress, all the way through the fifth Pan-Africanist Congress, W.E.B. Du Bois. He invited him to serve as his minister for Encyclopedia Africana. Ghana had become the Socialist Republic of Ghana because health care, education was free. There's an African saying which simply put means that he who has his mouth in the kitchen of his enemy can never be liberated. And he could not stop to take our mouth from the kitchen of the metropolis. Kwame Nkrumah believed in developing a new way forward where African economies could be transformed to cater for the needs of their own people without being dependent totally on external forces. One of the things that Nkrumah did was to establish a huge cattle ranch to provide the meat that our people needed. He also established a tannery to produce the leather, and then establish a shoe factory to turn the leather that has been produced by the tannery into shoes and other leather products for our people. 1964, I was 21 years old. I came to Ghana, and I, what I witnessed was just phenomenal. I didn't want to leave. I see new schools being built every day, free education. I see new hospitals being built, new clinics, free health care. I see factories being built by Africans, not by Chinese, not by South Koreans, but by Africans. In Ghana, you go there and you see African pilots. You see African news presenters. You hear African music, African clothes. And now in Ghana, we got our own national bank. Nkrumah also established the Black Star Line, which was a shipping line to promote trade between the African countries and Africans in the diaspora and so on. The significance of the flag of Ghana, and that is the symbolism held in the star. Just as Kwame Nkrumah said that the African can determine his own future if he's left alone. And the star, it really represents that star that Marcus Garvey, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, you know, had for the Black Star Liner. This would have moved Africa toward economic independence that antagonized the West. And particularly in Krumah's ambitions to unite the African continent within the context of a union government for Africa also made Nkrumah and his ideas a danger to imperialist interests. Coco at that time, alongside gold, was one of the key primary products that Ghana was exporting in order to derive foreign exchanging capital to manage its economy. Prices began to decline considerably and therefore this correlated with the declining living standards of most Ghanaians. From a high of 400 pounds per ton of cocoa in some, sometime 1965, it had fallen to about 80 pounds. We also have to remember that this decline in the cocoa prices was manipulated by various Western powers who wished to impose an economic squeeze on Kwame Nkrumah's government. And as a result, many Ghanaians became economically 
and also politically disenchanted with Nkrumah's government. He pegs wages at a time when inflation is raging. Not only does he do that, he demands that uh, workers contribute to um, a compulsory savings scheme. And that meant that you, you took some of your wages, but the rest of your wages were produced as a bond which you could cash in, in, I can't remember, three years or four years' time. And of course, those bits of paper were never, never produced. In addition to that, there was also a rise in corruption amongst officials, state officials and CPP officials um, that led many Ghanaians to, to question um, the CPP. The National Liberation Movement had taken the part of terrorism against Nkrumah. Supporters of Nkrumah were being killed on, on a regular basis. They were exploding bombs across the country and so on, and generally creating a situation of insecurity. He had a vision for the future. He was not really working for that year. He was, does not work for the public consumption. He was just doing it for the right reason, and that is why a lot of people fell apart and um, started to be confused and, uh, you know, doubting his intentions. They thought he was misguided. Imperialist forces stepped up their opposition, stepped up their action. There was about six or seven attempts on Nkrumah's life. In the 60s, there were many assassination attempts on Nkrumah. And one of them actually took place in the Flagstaff house, where he had his office and also his residence. A police officer was planted to shoot Nkrumah. This was a police officer on guard duty who attempted to shoot him with his rifle. He came and just opened the door, and at that time, Nkrumah was behind that door. It was a very heavy door. So he knocked him with the door and he fell. And Nkrumah himself disarmed him because he knew some basic techniques. Nkrumah likes jogging, he likes walking, he likes exercising, he likes doing judo, karate, you know, these little, little things. And you can see from the picture behind me, you know, Nkrumah putting down an assassin, you know, somebody who tried to assassinate him. These activities of sabotage, bombing, continued throughout the regime. Some of the actions he had to take to deal with the sabotage included the Preventive Detention Act, where people who were involved in this act of sabotage and destabilization were imprisoned. Today, countries like the United States of America, countries like the United Kingdom, have passed legislation which is similar to the Preventive Detention Act. Are we to say today that David Cameron is a dictator? Are we to say that Barack Obama is a dictator? Because they've essentially passed the same laws. Those laws were passed in response to the anarchy and recklessness of the opposition to Nkrumah. I remember the story which was put out by the opposition to Nkrumah that Nkrumah was keeping people in jail and maltreating them and so on. And they got photographs published in London and other places. Eventually it turned out that those photographs had been taken from a Togolese prison rather than a Ghanaian prison. Now I'm only beginning this research in two days in the National Archives in Washington, apart from finding that the consul was helping people form opposition political parties, I also found that in 1964, so two years before the coup, the head of the CIA has a meeting with the head of the State Department, their foreign office and says, I really think General Ankara would be the best person to take over. Now, if he says that in February 1964, it means he has already been dealing with the people plotting the takeovers and deciding whom to help with the takeover. There's one very, very significant cable which was dispatched from the British High Commission in Accra, and the British High Commissioner in Accra then was A.W. Snelling, who dispatched a cable to the Home Office, which simply said that the British establishment had to get rid of Nkrumah because he was making the African too politically conscious. What damning evidence. The factors that led to the coup that overthrew Kwame Nkrumah's government can be separated into internal factors 
and external factors. Um, among them were the declining economic situation in the country, whereby 1965, Ghana only had 500,000 pounds in sterling in their reserve account. Incrumers perceived meddling interference with the army and the police, particularly after the 1964 assassination attempt on him. He had removed the police chief and in the subsequent year, 1965, he'd also demoted several of the generals. Another important factor was also the fact that he had set up a new military structure known as the Presidential Own Guard Regiment with its own security apparatus and this was perceived as a threat by the army. However, the most critical external factor in the coup d'etat was the plotting and conspiracy by the United States of America, Britain and France with their near-colonial agents in the army, the Ghana army and the Ghana police force they acted in concert to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah. Now, all of these forces, Western intelligence forces and Western governments, plotted systematically against Nkrumah, recruited local collaborators and so on, in order to get rid of Nkrumah, not because Nkrumah was bad for the Ghanaian and African people, but simply because Nkrumah wanted to stop the exploitation of our resources for the benefit of others. Nkrumah had a slogan that when you're talking to the imperialists and he's smiling, he comes in, oh, hello, hello, how are you? Then he's making profit on you. But when the imperialist comes to sit with a straight face, it means the business is straightforward. In 1965, Osage Kwame Nkrumah wrote a book called Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. In this book, Kwame Nkrumah lays out the grand master plan for Europe and America's recolonization of Africa and did it elaborately. The Western world read that book and said, this man has to go. 24th of February 1966 coup took place when Nkrumah was out of the country. He was invited by President Ho Chi Minh um, the leader of North Vietnam to participate in peace initiatives to end the Vietnam War between Vietnam and America. Troops were moved from in Kumasi and Accra. The attack Flastaff House fought the president's own regimental guard. Uh, after that, they took over broadcasting. They made announcement to the country that the myth surrounding Nkrumah has been broken. That was wrong of the worst moments in the history of the entire African continent, the celebration of traitors. I spent that whole morning moving around a crowd with friends of mine, and we saw the carnage which was being unleashed on the city by these soldiers. I saw Nkrumah's security men arrested and beaten up. I saw them with bayonets in their chests and so on. He asked me whether I understood the meaning of a coup. And I told him that well, the, when the military takes over from a uh, you know, civilian government, they said he cracked the view that it's the additional meaning, but they said this is the beginning of a history in Africa. There will be several coups in Africa, and Africa will sink, and then the new Africa will develop out of the mess. Nkrumah went into exile in Guinea but managed to keep touch with the people of Ghana through frequent broadcasts. I came to Guinea in early 68, and this is when we proposed to Kwame Nkrumah to allow us to bring him back to Ghana, because we were ready to bring him back with guns blazing. I mean, we were young and we were ready, and excited, pumped up. Kwame Nkrumah looked at us, you know, and smiled, he took the guns out of our hands and put books in our hands. It was quite frustrating for me at the time. I didn't really understand. But thank God he did in his infinite wisdom. He knew we didn't know what we were doing. He knew that we needed to study. As co-president of Guinea, he helped shape economic and political policies and so on. 
But in addition to that, Nkrumah wrote a lot in Guinea. Nkrumah called the time in Guinea one of the most productive periods of his life. He wrote a number of books uh, during that period. He maintained contact with progressive embassies such as China, Cuba and other countries. He continued to have relations with uh, various Pan-Africanists all over the world and who went to meet him in Conakry. In the last three years of Nkrumah's life, he experienced deteriorating health. Initially, the cause of his illness was unknown and he sadly, tragically died of prostate cancer in April 1972. We pay homage today to the African of the millennium on his 102nd birthday. 21st of September has always been a day of inspiration and this remains true today. Let us use the memory of this great leader, President Kwame Nkrumah Osajifo, to spare our continent on to the next phase of the vision of the founders of our nations. But I believe his greatest legacy is the legacy that hasn't been realized yet, which is his vision of Africa. Because from the onset, he said that Ghana's independence, being the first African country to be independent, he didn't see it as the, the, the destination. He just said that, you know, Ghana's independence will be meaningless unless that victory leads to the total liberation of Africa. So Ghana was, Ghana's independence was on the path to that vision. So I believe that the realization of that vision is going to be his most important legacy. And I believe that it's going to be a generation right now who are going to rise up and realize that. Long live Osajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah. Kwame Nkrumah never died. Osajifo never died. Kwame Nkrumah never died. Nineteen years after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, 1884 marks the Conference of Berlin. European heads of state gathered together to stop fighting each other for one common goal, to carve up the continent of Africa and share the resources among themselves to empower their own countries. The land is rich with material resources like diamond, gold, copper, cocoa, and palm oil. The indigenous natives would continue to be mistreated after hundreds of years of colonialization. Before 1884, several warriors resisted against colonialism, invasion, and human abduction, like Shaka Zulu protecting Azania from the Dutch, Queen Nzinga protecting Angola from Portuguese, Samori Toure protecting Guinea Conquery from the French. Many warriors fought against slave conditions as well outside of the continent. Nanny of the Maroons in Jamaica, Jasper Yanga in Mexico, and more famously, Nat Turner in the U.S. Lots of great warriors fought and led resistance, but some Africans took the easy route and sold their own in exchange for the overwhelming gun power and status being associated with the increasingly powerful Europeans. In 1900, 16 years after the Berlin Conference, Henry Sylvester Williams, who was born in Trinidad, organized the first Pan-African Conference in London. The purpose of the conference was to discuss the issues of the black race as a whole worldwide. The conference wasn't a huge success, but one of the delegates was W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was born in America, in Massachusetts. In 1919, 36 years after the Conference of Berlin, Du Bois would convene the first Pan-African Congress this time. He stayed persistent and had following congresses leading up to 1945, the fifth Congress in the UK was the most successful one with the future president of Ghana in attendance, Osejufo Kwame Nkrumah. Osejufo means redeemer in a contradiction. 
Nkrumah was heavily influenced by the Honorable Marcus Garvey, who was born in Jamaica. Garvey is the only man till this day to organize 4 million people across the world with 1,800 different chapters with the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. Osejifo Kwame Nkrumah would convene the first Conference of Independent States in Ghana on April 15, 1958. This was the first Pan-African Conference on African soil, and it was attended by seven other heads of African state. That day was declared African Freedom Day. Osejifo insisted the independence of Ghana would be meaningless without the freedom of the rest of Africa, 74 years after the Berlin Conference. Five years later, on May 25th, in Ethiopia, the number of independent states went up to 31, and they convened a summit to form the Organization of African Unity, or OAU, and renamed African Freedom Day to African Liberation Day. Several leaders were targeted for their work towards Pan-Africanism, like Patrice Lumumba, Amakar Cabral, and also Malcolm X, who later in his life created the Organization of African American Unity, or OAAU, a model after the OAU. In 1966, Osejifo Kwame Nkrumah had his government overthrown, orchestrated by the CIA to stop the revolutionary momentum that was going on in the continent. Nkrumah, however, completed the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare in 1968. He called for the formation of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, or AAPRP, and 51 years later today, approximately 135 years after the Berlin Conference, organizers of the AAPRP carry on the legacy and continue to teach and utilize the legacy of African Liberation Day and develop themselves into newborn leaders among the masses. The AAPRP is one of the groups passing on the torch of black liberation. African unity is our only option to eradicate all problems of the continent and the children of the diaspora. We will win forward ever, backward never. Nkrumah was focused on the, um, having one unified Africa and was really keen on how um, the independence of Ghana is not enough. It's about the continent. It's about all of our people. And so that's definitely a takeaway for me. And what we're going to be doing now is we're going to go into a discussion where um, some of you have registered and you're going to join us in Zoom and uh, we'll be able to have a discussion. We've prepared some um, questions um, in advance to discuss and uh, others can also ask questions in the comments. So we, we're just, um, again, excited to be in this space and celebrate um, our ancestors and we continue on the work of our ancestors doing revolutionary organizing, um, fighting for our people. Are y'all able to hear us? I saw that there were some audio issues. Are those now resolved? Sock, pu sock puppetsky, help us out. Can you hear us now? Yay, thank you. So they can hear us. So yeah, I definitely, if y'all have any like thoughts that came up as you watched the movies, drop them in the comments. I can say that what Monika just said definitely resonated with me. Um, just the idea that like, yeah, he saw like Ghana as like one piece and like a larger struggle. He wasn't just like, sweet, Ghana's free, let's chill. He was like, no, we need all, all of Africa, Africa to be free. So we do have, we did have a question from the audience actually um, from Darren who said, I had to step away 
Was there a physical struggle against colonial power for the liberation of Ghana? And I said in response, yes, there was a campaign of positive action that included the general strike, that included work stoppages, that included mass mobilizations. And that was part of the reason why um, Britain conceded when Ghana asked for its independence, because the African people in Ghana mobilized to stop the economy. They were like, we want to be free and we are not gonna let y'all continue to profit off this country. So we're gonna engage in organized action until you give us what we want. Um, and so Darren went on to clarify, sorry, I meant violent resistance, guerrilla warfare, and no, that did not happen in Ghana um, before, before Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. It was the campaign of positive action. It was the mass people's movement that applied that pressure. And then after Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, um, and then he was, he was uh, exiled to Guinea because he was not allowed to return to Ghana because of the imperialist powers, that's when he wrote the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, where he was like, look, if we tried it this way, it's not going to work. We have to engage in armed, like a continental armed struggle against imperialism and colonialism in order to realize the total liberation of Africa. Like, there's no way around it. And that's part of the reason why he called for the creation of the African People's Revolutionary Party to unify all of the struggling parties in the continent. And also why, in that same book, he called for the creation of the All African People's Revolutionary Army to form a continental anti colonial army to back up the national liberation struggle of the continent. Thank you, Anya Sabu. So yes, if you can share some of uh, your initial thoughts or some of the initial thoughts you um, that you're reflecting on uh, at the end of the screen. And what are some thoughts? I see DJ Bril on the Zoom and Monique as well. And like as we wait for folks to come in and give their questions, why don't we like discuss what we thought we took from this movie? Because I know that neither of y'all have seen it before. So what were your thoughts? Do you have thoughts? I had some questions, but let me see. I have some. I have some notes in here that I took. Um, Greetings, Tracy. So we had some folks register to join the discussion via Zoom, and so that's who you see popping in on video as well. Hi, Comrade Tracy. Good to good to see you, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> And we definitely encourage folks on Zoom to like jump in with any you know observations or questions you have or comments. So uh, just the other thought that I had was um, around uh, the coup that happened with um, uh, removing Kwame um, Nkrumah uh, as prime minister. And so some of the thoughts that I thought about was, because I have not read his book, um, is um, my, my thoughts were about similar to this, similar to what we see in this country, is how, well, actually, no, I, I have a thought. So there's, a, there's a, a quote that someone, or there's something that someone says that was really profound to me. It says, no oppressor abandons oppression as a gift to the oppressor, right? Because that doesn't make sense. Why would they no longer want to oppress us when they continue to exploit us um, and profit off of, off of us? So we have to fight to remove the oppressor. And that was so profound to me also, because what I'm reflecting on is um, the push that I've been seeing on, on social media and in conversations about um, voting, right? And so like how we're gonna vote our way out of the, out, vote our way to liberation is what I feel is being said, which makes no sense, right? So um, I, I feel like what happened in Ghana is a very, very clear example of what, of, um, and also what happens in this country all the time is there is no intent to vote somebody in a capitalist, imperialist society, which is why um, we have to fight and dismantle everything. Um, and we also, I also, we also saw that in Ghana where, um, um, like the cocoa exchange, right? And the economy started dropping and that was intentionality. So that was intentionality for me, what I thought was to create a divide in Ghana, right? To create more struggle in Ghana. So the more people struggle, um, the more people start to, uh, 
the more challenges it has, like internally, externally. And so all of that to me is intentional. So it just resonated with me also about what's happening in this country um, around, like we think our press, our oppressors are just gonna, not we, because I don't <laughs> think that our oppressors are just gonna gift us and say, oh, um, yes, you're, you're liberated now. And the other thing I really liked is they use the word racial equality versus like African liberation and how those two are different. Um, and so I was, I'm really processing and reflecting on that now and how oftentimes a lot of organizing work that we see is around racial equality when we can never get that, like because the system is embedded in white supremacy. And so because we could never get that, our fight should be for the liberation. So those are some of my thoughts. That last point you made about, you know, the difference between a focus, a struggle that's focused on addressing, you know, so-called racial inequality and a struggle that's focused on anti-colonialism and independence are very, very, very different. Like the APRP is abs- like is not, is not an anti-racist or racial justice organization. We are a revolutionary socialist anti-colonial organization for precisely what they were talking about in that video. A struggle for racial inequality is about a struggle to be treated better within an inherently unjust system, within the inherently unjust and also racist system of capitalism and colonialism. We're not fighting for that. We don't want equality under capitalism. We want no capitalism, no capitalism. So I feel like that fundamental difference is extremely key for people to understand about Kwame Nkrumah, about Pan-Africanism as a movement, and also about this organization. We are not about racial justice. We are very intentional about being about national liberation and socialism and revolution. Other folks um, in the comments, sock puppet sock puppet ski. Why can't I say that? It's like very uh, it's very simple. Um, but they were mentioning that this film cemented their hatred of the CIA, the United States Central Intelligence Agency, because of course the role they played in the overthrow of the government of Kwame Nkrumah. Other things that that comrade's pointing out is that the thing that was so inspiring, inspiring is Kwame's work ethic, working two jobs, and studying and making connections with other people interested in revolution. Do others have any thoughts as well? And one thing that this movie is really good about pointing out that maybe people didn't know is like the time that Kwame Nkrumah spent in the United States, in Harlem, um, learning about the struggle of African people in the United States, learning about, you know, all different kinds of politics within the United States because he had the opportunity to go to school here and how that helped influence the movement that he built in Ghana because, or helped build in Ghana. Because like a lot of times when people talk about Pan-Africanism, they don't understand that it was like truly a movement across the diaspora. Like Pan-Africanism was born in the Western Hemisphere and then brought to Ghana and made into, and brought to Africa and made into a weapon. Like all, African people from all different parts of the world, not just the continent, not just the United States, not just the Caribbean, not just South, uh, Central and South America, we all came together to build this particular strategy to overthrow colonialism and liberate Africa. So like the time that Kwame Nkrumah spent in Harlem is as important as the time he spent in Europe and the time he spent building the movement in Africa. We have a comment in the Zoom. Tracy says, woo, woo, woo. Thank you for clarifying the difference between racial justice and African liberation. Yeah, thank you um, for joining us. And it's like so, it's so important. Like it's so important to understand why the fight is not about racial justice. If the fight is about racial justice, you're always gonna be making like incremental gains that are quickly taken away within a system that is fundamentally unjust. Like that's why we can have like, you know, voting rights given to our people or integrated lunch counters or like be granted the right, like f f four centuries in to wear our hair that we, we, we want bleh, the way we want to. But the fundamental nature of our people's relationship to this society and this system never changes. No matter what incremental gains we have, that bring us closer to the appearance of equality within capitalism, the fundamental nature of the relationship, one that is built on our exploitation and exploitation of Africa, never changes. They just like change like the aesthetic. They change yeah. what it looks like. They don't actually change the nature of it. What that makes me think of is like the 13th Amendment. 
So there's uh, 2.3 million people um, behind the walls, right, that are enslaved. And 33% of them are African. Yeah. And uh, then there's 6 million people on probation and parole. So in both of those populations, the majority of them cannot vote. So there's voting rights, and then all those rights are taken away from those people. So again, like you said, they have ways. It's I call it the sleight of a hand. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, or I think about it even in, in Albuquerque here. Um, um, our, our mayor's office here, and then we're like, we support black lives. We're giving a million dollars to the black community. I don't even know what that is. Right. <laughs> like, what will a million dollars do? <laughs> like, and who is the black community? Is. Like, who's getting the money? You know, they're supposedly making some advisory council to decide on how that money could be spent. That's not even crumbs. That's even worse than crumbs. It's a huge insult. Uh, so it's like we're, we're arresting people like Clifton White. We're doing relentless pursuit where we're, gonna, where we're targeting African and Chicano people and locking them up. And now here's this million dollars. Like, it's the side of the hand. It's a facade. So all of it is a facade. So voting rights, it's a facade. Um, people trying to pass these policies that are, say they're about our people, it's a facade because in the background they're doing something else. Right. It's actually, that reminds me of like Joe Biden, right? Like Joe Biden's all like Black Lives Matter now, even though he's been racist his whole life. Like he's been racist, like materially racist in all ways for the entirety of his political career. Like this is a man that literally organized against desegregation because he didn't want his children to go to school with Africans. And so this is like, there's like a very clear paper trail of him engaging in like the, this behavior, these like, you know, actions on a political level that had like material consequences for African and colonized people. But now in 2020, he's like, Black Lives Matter? All this kind of shit, like he's allowed to say that. And at the same time, he's like, I would also like to give $300 million in additional funding to police. I think we need to hire more police. I would like to increase the military budget. So not only will colonized and African people catch hell in the United States, but also catch hell around the world, but this man's allowed to sit, he's allowed to like fix his mouth to say Black Lives Matter, despite the fact that the material impact of his actions is like death and devastation for African and colonized people, both the United States and around the world. It's what we're talking about. Like there's like, when the limit of your struggle for liberation is within like the system that's oppressing you, all you're ever gonna get is like slightly moving the pieces around and changing what it looks like and how we talk about it. There's never going to be a change in the fundamental nature of the relationship. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I forgot BLM was uh, aligned with the Democratic Party. Completely <laughs> forgot about that for a moment. Um, but I also think about, oh, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. It'll come back to me. Wait. Some other things that really stuck out to me about this movie um, was kind of like how Kwame Nkrumah was deeply influenced by Marcus Garvey. And that stood up stood out to me because the one thing I've noticed recently is like a lot of people being extremely reckless about Marcus Garvey, like being like disrespectful about Marcus Garvey, about like diminishing the impact that he had. Um, but like the comrade Seku Neblet, who was a member of the APRP in the Ghana chapter, pointed out to this day, Marcus Garvey has has built the largest organization for African people that has ever existed on this planet. The UNIA to this day is still the largest organization of African people, working class African people that has ever existed. But people in the United States, I've noticed like a lot of like, um, you know, European leftists or unfortunately like African leftists that are kind of like, you know, like adjacent to European leftists. That's the nicest way I can say that. I've noticed people being, like being really reckless about Marcus Garvey, like diminishing him. And Kwame Nkrumah was like, no, like he, this, this man and his ideas and the work he did is a major part of the reason why I developed this particular conception of African liberation that required the leadership of African people, that would put it into the hands solely of African people. Like Marcus Garvey saying African for Africans, Marcus Garvey saying like rise up race, like that was a vast influence on climate Nkrumah and a vast influence on Pan-Africanism as a whole. Thank you for that. So true. Um, uh, I remember my thought now is um, everything is so strategic and um, like really targeting us and really striving to continue this capitalist state is they, they don't even try to hide it. Yeah. So Biden didn't even try to hide it. 
like Obama didn't even try to hide. None of none of it's hidden, right? It's not hidden. Um, I think people are a little bit confused because um, like Trump's more like outward facing, which like I really love and appreciate outward racism more Me than too. anything. Me too. But it's very clear uh, what they're doing. It's they don't even try to hide it, and so I don't know why we would be um, like why we would fall like oh yes, Biden is really going to try to help our people. Well, if Obama did it, <laughs> like, um, do you realize what Biden did with the crime bill? Like his career was made off of incarcerating our people that have created generational harm, generational harm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I also feel like people are not honest about Biden. Like they want to believe like the best in them for some reason. I don't really understand. But we actually got a question from the audience. Um, so Comrade asked, I remember the documentary said that once Kwame took power, there was discontent with the economic situation imposed by the US. Do you think there was something maybe he could have done better to handle the economic sabotage? Can we look at two other revolutionaries that, ugh, other revolutionaries that gained state power that we can learn from when dealing with that issue? That's a really good question. Thanks, y'all. Um, so yeah, what the Comrade is referencing is that because the British colonialism had turned Ghana into like a basically like a mono export culture where like the primary um, product of Ghana's economy was like cocoa, they just like tanked the price of cocoa globally and like in that way were able to drastically impact Ghana's economy. So part of that was like out of Kwame Nkrumah's hands, right? Because it wasn't African people in Ghana that chose to make it like a mono what's the word for it? Like a mono export economy. Like they did not cho choose to like center Ghana's entire economy around the export of cocoa. It was like the British that did that. Um, and then once Kwame Nkrumah came power, he had like a very, very brief period of time um, to nationalize that industry and then also to diversify it. So in a lot of ways, it was kind of out of his hands because that was what um, colonialism did. But at the same time, I do think that there are things that we can look at to learn from from the situation. Um, that actually, if you read some of uh, some of Kwame Nkrumah's writing, like Africa Must Unite, like the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, um, like his autobiography, where he himself is like, this is some things that we could have done differently. So one of the things was that once Ghana, once Britain granted Ghana independence because of the movement of African people in Ghana that forced them to do so, Kwame Nkrumah and like the CPP kind of thought that they could use the infrastructure that remained in place, and even like some British employees to continue the, the project of national liberation. Of course, that was not the case. Those people were treacherous as fuck. Those people had no intention of ever working with him. There was a lot of direct sabotage. Um, and so I think that the belief that they could use that existing structure to further Ghana's independence was like idealistic. But at the same time, if they had like torn it down completely, like what, who, who what would have been in their place considering that Ghana was intentionally underdeveloped? So yeah, I just wonder, like, they were kind of like in a rock and a hard place, you know? But definitely, like, you have to destroy, like, you can't work with the existing colonial structure. You have to destroy it and replace it. And that's, like, what, what ha happened in Guinea with Saka Toure. Like, France, like, was like, you know what? Once uh, Guinea gained independence, France was like, fuck you. And, like, literally, like, destroyed the structure, destroyed their files. Like, literally, like, just, like, trash it on their way out. And Guinea was, like, forced to build from the ground up. I think that that same process can happen and we can like choose it rather than it being like spite from, you know, the colonial power. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, but in, in like in a nutshell, I think that Kwame Nkrumah and Ghana were in a rock and a hard place because of actions taken by the British. And also one thing they could have done to like mitigate that was like build from the ground up rather than trying to use the existing colonial structure. Let's see other comments, other comments. There's another question. Um, I don't know this answer. You might, on your side, well, the sister in the documentary named other leaders in Africa, Amilcar Cabral, Patrice Bumba, and somebody from Zambia. Do you know who the third person was? I know who you mean, but I forget the name. You're going to have to watch that again, Carmen. Let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't recall the name off the top of my head. So there's a... There's a couple there's a couple thoughts, uh, one in the chat and one in the comments. So it says the film displayed the unity and organizing that we are capable of. And that was so inspiring, inspiring. For sure. I agree. I feel like the campaign of positive action was remarkable. 
because it wasn't a traditional armed struggle, but it was like hundreds of thousands of Africans being like, we are not, we are going to bring this shit to a grinding halt until we gain independence. So it was ex- actually like extremely militant. Even though it wasn't an armed struggle, it was like a show of collective force that the British were forced to respond to. And like something like that, like the closest analog I can think of on a much smaller scale was like the Montgomery bus boycott, right? And like the the period in the history of the African liberation struggle in the United States, where instead of like, you know, saying like being like, let's get a seat at the table and negotiate, our people were like, nope, we are not going to work with you until you meet our demands. We're going to take collective action to make sure you meet those demands. It's like a very, very different kind of strategy than the one we've been resigned to for the past few decades. It's like one of like uncompromising opposition unless we get what we want, which is what we need to do. Another comment I see um, from Moses is that the positive action campaign started in Ghana, was continued and occupied Azania by the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania under the leadership of President Mangaliso Robert Sibukwe. The emblem of ZANU is a cockerel like that of the CPP. The struggle continues forward ever. Izweletu, Pemberi, Nechimarenga. Thank you, comrades. That was an incredible comment because it really like traces the influence of Kwame Nkrumah like across the continent. And like a really, really important thing to understand about like all the revolutionary African leaders you know from the continent is that they almost all of them knew each other and were like in conversation with each other. And that's something that's like super lost in the way that the West engages the African liberation struggle. Like for example, Thomas Sankara is someone that has kind of ter- been turned into an icon, almost like the African version of Che Guevara, where all you see is his face or like a picture of him with a guitar. And people talk about him like he was like his own thing on an island. But Thomas Sankara was like mentored by Amical Cabral, was mentored by Sekou Toure, was mentored by, uh, by Kwame Nkrumah. He would not have existed as a political entity without this Pan-Africanist movement that encompassed all these revolutionary African leaders. They all worked together. The very first work study circle of the All African People's Revolutionary Party was Kwame Nkrumah, Sekou Toure from Guinea, Amical Cabral from Guinea-Bissau, uh, Lamine Yanga from Senegal, I believe, and then Sekou Neblet, who was in the video. He's a comrade who used to be in the Black Panther Party who joined the APRP. So the very first work study circle the APRP ever had had all of these revolutionary African leaders operating in different parts of the continent coming together around the same motherfucking plan and ideology. I feel like people treat them as if they were operating isolated from each other when they were working together in conversation, learning from each other, supporting each other the whole time. And a comrade, in the, I even wrote this down, a person in the video even says, let me see, that Ghana acted as a rear base for the struggle to liberate the entire continent. Mm-hmm. That Ghana was like literally like a, like a safe, like a liberated zone that people used to like wage the struggle to liberate all of Africa. So when you talk about Thomas Sankara, when you talk about Tsubukwe, when you talk about Robert Mugabe, when you talk about, you know, Amical Cabral, when you talk about any revolutionary African leader, understand that these people knew each other, they were talking to each other, and they were working together. Other comments and thoughts. Our comrade from Inta Conquista, Ramiro, says, great stream. Thank you, comrade. Thanks for support. Thanks for watching. We appreciate you. Yeah, that's dope. I didn't know that. (laughs) But but it's, but it's, um, we're all connected. Like, we're, this work is about us. It's about all of us, um, all across the diaspora. And so I have a question, um, for the audience or for you, um, Anya Sabu. I think about um, like how do we see ourselves as one big community? How do we how do we unify to see that um, our struggles are connected here and across the diaspora? Like, what does that look like? Uh, anyone in the comments could answer, um, or as well on Zoom. Oh, so uh, um, a comrade from APIP says the. The person from Zambia that was mentioned was Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth Kaunda, K-A-U-N-D-A, was the third person uh, from Zambia. Thank you, comrade. Thank you. And and the reason why I asked that question is people think that it's so far-fetched that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it can be. Because if not, there's continued more struggle, 
there's continued more harm to our people. And so um, one way has been tried for so long and it hasn't been working. Um, but we have seen places like Guinea-Bissau um, and others that have like successfully been victorious and, and um, overthrowing imperialism. So we know that it's successful, but how do we get our people to be like not so social conditioned to just go with that? They, they've normalized it. They normalize their oppression. Like how do we, we're, I was on Facebook and we we're having a discussion um, and um, it was not somebody with, who's African, but somebody who's colonized. And they were sharing, um, I have this in place, this in place, this in place, this in place, but I'm not ready for the revolution yet. So I'm just curious to like what people's thoughts are for people to see that like we're that that the only way to win is to do this together. I definitely feel like our a lot of people are not. I don't believe that we can win. Like I saw that conversation you're talking about, and I feel like the missing thing for that person was organization. Like if you're not, like I I know what mindset my mindset was before I joined the APRP versus after and I joined APRP like seven years ago and if you would ask me like do you believe it's possible to engage in a revolution to overthrow capitalism and build socialism I would have been like why would I want to build socialism and also no <laughs> like I would have I wouldn't have believed it was possible but because I'm in a revolutionary organization because I can see on like a small scale how it's possible to like take collective action and like change our conditions in a real way I can see it happening then I know now I know it's possible Plus, I've been to Cuba and I saw it work. But, like, I feel like for a lot of people, they do not believe that we can win. Like, they don't think that we're strong enough. And the reason for that is because they're not in organizations. They don't have the experience of building collectively outside of the system. But what do other folks think? Uh, our comrade DJ Rail said uh, and said, uh, I think it's very challenging, but I do think it's possible. I think it starts with the conversation. Yeah, yeah I definitely agree because um, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, one thing that I reflect on is in AAPRP and any revolutionary organization that I'm aware of, they all have work study. And the reason why is to ha understand political education and to build your ideology. And so I think about how um, how that's critical because you're all, you're able to like grow collectively, organize with other revolutionary groups, um, and you're able to have conversations. So you you have all this information that you're able to also share with the community. So you don't keep the information to yourself. You're able to share, like I didn't get to go to Cuba, but uh, the brigade got to go and Onya Sabu got to go and they got to bring that information back. And we got to learn about what Cuba is doing. Um, and so that information back is, is, is more than hope because it's, it's the possibility of it actually happening if we come together. So that's one thing that I think is, that's why it's important because when people don't know, if they don't know that there has been um, uprisings and takeovers that have worked and that we can learn from they continue to to do as is and that as is is um harmful and the other thing i didn't know this you you talked about it is the P pic or pig in guinea bissau the pigc the pigc about how not only are they focused on like adults organized for liberation, but how all ch how children, how everyone's involved mm -hmm. uh, in the movement for liberation. And so like how it doesn't have to be your, um, like we're all leaders, we're all leaders in the movement. It doesn't have to be like one person, it's children. Like children are, are involved in that, in that struggle as well together uh, with adults. So I also think that's really imperative and important because um, we're gonna get there all together. Right. Yeah, so for folks that don't know, um, like Monica mentioned, the PIGC is the Revolutionary African People's Socialist Organization, the mass political organization in Guinea-Bissau that helped wage the struggle against Portuguese colonialism. 
Um, Eamon Call Cabral, alongside, was one of the founders of that party. Um, and that party successfully overthrew Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau and exists to this day. And in that organization, there are millions of people. Like, if you are like a, a maybe like a European leftist, you might be like familiar with the concept of like a vanguard party. The APIP and the PIDC are very intentionally not vanguard parties. We are mass political parties, meaning we are trying to organize like every sector of our people into political formations of like millions of people. So PIDC is a mass political party and is the party that overthrew Portuguese colonialism. Also like a really important note about the PIDC is that, so Anne McCall Cabral founded it. Anne McCall Cabral was like one of the leading ideologues of that movement and of Pan-Africanism in general. Anne McCall Cabral was assassinated before Guinea-Bissau gained independence from the Portuguese. They won after he died. And that is a testament to how powerful it is to organize every sector of a society around the goal of liberation, right? Like you can't just put it in the hands of a handful of people or in the hands of one man. What the PIGC did was create like literally thousands, thousands of leaders within that movement, within that organization, so that it meant once Emmanuel Cabral was killed, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. They had the infrastructure required to win that struggle, still, without him. And that's like a testament to his leadership, and it's also a testament to the organization and the political education process of the PIGC. Um, we have some comments from, um, from folks in Zoom. One comment is, ultimately, you cannot force people to change. It happens at their own pace. Also, another comment saying we have to know and agree on our common goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we do work study. Malcolm X said one time, you can't organize the sleeping people. You have to wake them up, and then you get some action. That's like precisely why we do political education in the form of work study in the APRP. Because if we were trying to be like, let's build Pan-Africanism, y'all, and people don't even understand what Pan-Africanism is, like, we're just not going to go anywhere. <laughs> if they don't understand what it is, if they don't understand why we have to do it, if they don't understand how it came to be as, like, a particular strategy to overthrow colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism, there's, like, absolutely no way. Like, they might do what you say because they like you, but they won't understand why they're doing it. And then if you get hit by a bus, they're going to be like, well, I'm going to go away now. <laughs> like, they're just not, they're not going to continue the work forward unless they understand why it has to happen for themselves. And then they will take it up on their own. Another comment I see in Facebook is we've been so conditioned to believe, it's naive, to believe in our own ability to unify and use our power to move through and past neocolonialism and neoliberalism. Multi mutual education and dialogue, not condescending, goes a long way, but ultimately taking action together at different levels and through different schemes will move us forward. Thank you for that comment. And then Monique is saying in Zoom, yes, and the All African People's Revolutionary Goal is one unified socialist Africa. We define Pan-Africanism just like Kwame Nkrumah as one unified socialist Africa, African liberation for Africa, the continent, and also for the African diaspora all over the world. That is our objective. One comment I had, or one question I had, was about how, so like how Kwame Nkrumah was able to find like the synthesis between like the best of Marcus Garvey and the best of W.E.B. Du Bois. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is, is because like in the year of our Lord 2020, <laughs> there's still some people who think that there's like, there's no way to reconcile the ideas of Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and the reason for that is because when those men were alive, they had beef, they had public beef, they fought, they insulted each other. They did not, they did not get along. But in the building of Pan-Africanism, in developing the strategy and ideology for Pan-Africanism, um, Kwame Nkrumah was able to take like the best of both men's ideas and create something to move us forward. So a question I have for folks is why is it that people are still like prosecuting this beef between two dead men and why do y'all think that Kwame Nkrumah was able to like look past the beef and take the best of both of them and move us forward and also which strategy do you think is better Let's 
So could I ask for clarification? Um, I'm trying to think of, um, could you share a little bit more about context about what the beef was? <laughs> about. <laughs> it was just ideological differences. Cause uh, Marcus Garvey was like, you know, he was like Africa for Africans. He had like a particular vision. And at the time, W.B. Du Bois did not agree with it. At the time he was kind of like, we got to figure out how to make it work here. And I don't understand what this man's talking about. And it was just like an ideological difference at a particular point in time, a difference in how we should approach the liberation in our, of our people. And I would yeah. argue that towards the end of his life, Dubois moved more towards what Garvey was talking about, although from like a revolutionary socialist position. But at the time, they were they had political differences about how to proceed. So, OK, that's what I thought you were talking about. So um, I think that. Uh, W.E.D. Du Bois, uh, so like I've read more of his, like the recent work, but I think that um, Marcus Garvey had a more Pan-African view than W.E. Du Bois initially. And as uh, we grow, we grow, we evolve, we learn. And uh, he started to have more of a paradigm shift about like what Pan-African actually look like. And so I think that they're more aligned than people think mm -hmm. right and so I also um didn't really know fully about the the beef they had and so I watched a few a few things and I would have outward beef too <laughs> <laughs> I mean I have beef now with people <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so um but I think Kwame Nkrumah was able to gather both because both were um were doing critical work for our people both uh, were work, working um, around like the liberation of our people, but had had thoughts about different approaches. And um, I really like the works that I've read. It's more of like the evolution of W. E. Du Bois. I haven't read any of like his earlier work. And so um, there's so much what we learn from. We can learn from all of our ancestors who've been in the in struggle, revolutionary work, revolutionary struggle, revolutionary organizing. Um, and so I, um, I didn't know uh, Kwame Nkrumah had um, such um, ties to Marcus Gravy, but it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Like everything that we learn about is about centering our people. Everything that we learn about is, um, and it's not about empowerment. It's about us knowing that we have the abilities and the gifts and the solutions to save ourselves, to unify and organize. So I feel like Kwame Nkrumah was able to see um, both of these ancestors as critical in movement work. And so why not? Why not uh, take what they're saying that works for them and, and do the work for, and move the work forward? Because at the end of the day, it's about our people. It's not about, uh, it's not about, it's about our people. It's not about ego. Mm -hmm. like. What is, Nicole, what is Marcus Garvey saying that fills your heart, that fills your soul? What is um, uh, W.E. Du Bois saying that does that as well? And like, how do you synthesize and uh, come across your own analysis and your own conclusion? And, and Kwame Nkrumah was able to do that. He took the best of both of them and he left all the rest. And I also want to point out, so they talked about like the, the five Pan-African Congresses. They talked about how the first four had like a particular ideological orientation that was focused on like it, they were like anti-colonial in essence is how Kwame Ture puts it. But they were but the demands were mostly about like, hey, imperialist powers, do right by us, please. <laughs> and then and then we got to the fifth one and it, had, it went from having like a largely academic character and being based outside of the continent to the fifth one that had like a mostly working class character, like a movement character. It was based in the continent. And then all of a sudden the demands went from being kind of like, you know, integrationist, assimilationist, like anti-colonial in essence, but about appealing to the colonial power structure to being like militantly anti-colonial to saying that regardless of what y'all are doing, we're going to organize African people to win our liberation point blank. And it's really important to understand that like, so Dubois was like an honorary, uh, an honorary speaker at the fifth Pan-African Congress because of the work he did to build the first four. 
And the fifth Pan-African Congress was organized in part by Marcus Garvey's wife, by Amy Jax Garvey. So I'm like, why is it in 2020 that people who were not even alive when these men are beefing are still prosecuting this beef? When Kwame Nkrumah, like their wives, Shirley Gamma Dubois and Amy Jax Garvey, like these people were able to just take the good shit and leave the rest, like leave, like stop prosecuting the beef, stop acting like they have to pick a side, like just take what's gonna take us forward and leave everything else. Like I feel like it's an indication of the individualism that capitalism teaches us, you know, that it's about like one figure and how that figure felt about the people around him rather than the movement that that figure came from. And it's also an indication of how people don't understand that like folks are capable of growth. Like WB Du Bois started off talking about the talented 10th, started off talking about we need to find our way in the United States. And when he died, he was a revolutionary Pan-African socialist. He was like, the, the wealth of Africa needs to be in the hands of the masses of the African people, not any talent and tech. He like, re- he renounced that ideology and he spent the entire rest of his life building the power and analysis of the masses of working class African people. So we have to recognize that it's not our job to prosecute this beef, that people can grow and change their ideas over the course of an extremely long life and that we don't have to take sides anymore. If Kwame Nkrumah didn't take sides, if Kwame Nkrumah was like, Man, Marcus Garvey inspired me to say only Africans can do this. And WB inspi- Dubois inspired me with historical materialist analysis to understand how we got here. Then we can do it too. And there's absolutely no reason to continue to prosecute this disunity within our movement. If the people directly involved can find the middle ground, then you watching from the peanut gallery can absolutely do that too. So stop that shit. Stop it. I want to I want to elaborate. So I said ego and I said the wrong word. When you're talking around individualism, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Right? It's really uh fixated on that individualism. And I also wonder if that's intentionally to like sabotage movement work too. Um yeah, yeah I'm just reflecting on that. I think it is. I think it is. And I feel like the people that like propagated the beef, the reason why it's like still a thing like in the year of our Lord 2020 is not because of us. And I believe that in, deeply in my heart. I feel like they, uh, they elevate, the, they do it with like um, Malcolm X and MLK too. They act like these were men that like hated each other, right? Like they, they like say like, you have to choose one or the other. And people in the movement, even at the time didn't do that. So it's just, it's just a particular way that our struggle is talked about in this particular society. And I don't think it's coming from us. That's so true. I thank you for making that comparison of how they do Malcolm and Martin, right? It's, they think it like it's an either or. And um, actually, like you said, people grow. And Malcolm was, uh, not Malcolm, um, uh, Martin Luther King was really moving, uh, moving in the paradigm before this country assassinated him, right? Like he was able to say, um, I feel I led my people into a burning house. Mm-hmm. Like he was able to see like, oh, wait, this system, um, there's no way it could work in this system. Like, it's burning. It's, and it's, and it's, it's so blurming. It's infernal burning, right? Um, so, yeah, w- that comparison is what they do. So I do believe it's, um, it's intentional sabotage. Um, there's a comment that says, uh, two great minds were bound to meet someday, and they eventually met in person of Kwame Nkrumah. That's a beautiful way to put that. He really did. Like he put the black star on Ghana's flag and he made like he gave W.B. Du Bois like a position in his government. And to this day, like um, W.B. Du Bois house in Ghana is like a museum. I've been there um, like he's venerated for the contribution he made to Ghana's in Ghanaian independence and also to like the struggle to build Pan-Africanism on the continent. So like, yeah, like the disrespect that both Du Bois and Garvey get in this particular context in the United States, the elevation of the beef, it has very little relationship to the work, who they actually were and the contributions they each actually made. It's not coming from us. And yet Prudence says, yep, we're falling for it. <sighs> um, next question I have is, oh yeah. So Kwame Nkrumah quote that I really, really like um, that I wanna talk about briefly is he said, thought without action is empty action without thought is blind 
How does that make you feel, Monika? What are your thoughts around that phrase? I wrote it down too. And I was like, wow, that's powerful. <laughs> and so, um, like, action is so important. But it's critical to think about how we're going to take action as a collective. So that reminds me of when um, Kwame Nkrumah was in um, Guinea-Bissau. And uh, um, the people were ready to fight. They had guns. They were ready to bear arms. They're ready to go uh, uh, take Ghana back for the people. And, and Kwame Nkrumah um, handed them a book. <laughs> and it was... Uh, for me is um, you can't take action if we're not if we're not organized if we're not pl- if we don't have a um, if we don't have a plan and so I think about um, and we built that together right so we built that together um, in the AAPRP chapter New Mexico and we built it across chapters across this country we built it across ca- chapters uh, globally, and we're taking action together. But we have to think about what action are we going to take um, in order to bring about change. And so that's what I think about um, around uh, like the action without thought and, and how they work hand in hand. Absolutely agree. And again, yeah, like you pointed out, it's like precisely how the APRP works, right? Like we have the work study process to get that unity of thought to develop our like collective analysis and critical thinking skills and then we have like the action component like we have the school of african roots we have the breakfast program in oregon chapter we have the elder care program here in new mexico chapter we have like the rental assistance program that we're going to be started all of these external projects that we do in the community are guided by this collective thought that is developed by a process of political education that's why like it's so key like political education is like by far the most important thing that we do like by far the most important thing that happens in the aprp is work study because work study is where we develop the collective analysis that guides the entirety of the rest of our work the entirety of the rest of our work and if we didn't have that work study process to be frank we'd just be doing a bunch of random stuff <laughs> like a bunch of like random disconnected things which is like honestly what a lot of organizational work looks like <laughs> That's true. Over and over, that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> like with no purpose. Exactly. So there's no purpose. There's no no. There's no intent. One hundred percent. We have a YouTube comment from someone with a really dupe, dope name, Nakuma Ture. He says, "There's a general confusion regarding Du Bois and Garvey in the West that is fermented by Western propaganda. We understand the positive contribution of both, so there's no confusion to Nakumas. Absolutely." Absolutely. Like exactly what we were saying, like the continued prosecution of the beef between those two men is not being propagated by African people. It is not us that is making that beef continue to be a thing. It is not us. Same thing with MLK and Malcolm. It's not us doing that. It's people like feeding that shit to us and us repeating it. That's That's right. Darren is asking, how does someone become part of the political education study group? Um, So in order to attend the All African People's Revolutionary Party work study, you must be a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We got chapters all over the world. We are speaking to y'all from Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque. So this is the New Mexico chapter. We have chapters throughout the United States, um, in Canada, in Europe, and our strongest and biggest chapters are in Africa itself. Um, so yeah, if you are a person of African descent, like African, meaning black, then you can join the African People's Revolutionary Party where you are. And if you want to join, you can reach out to us by email. I'll put our email in the comments. Um, but yeah, so if you are African and you would like to join the APRP, please reach out to us. Um, but in order to attend work study, you must be in the APRP. If you're not African and you want to be part of like a political education process, you need to join a political organization that like has that process. Like you need to join an organization that has a organized political education component in order to continue this work. And that should honestly be like the litmus test for any organization that calls itself revolutionary. Like if you do not have an organized process of collective study, then you're just going to be doing a bunch of random shit. You're just going to be doing a bunch of random shit. 
I don't really know how you call yourself revolutionary. So find an organization like that near you. Here in Tiwa territory, we have like the Red Nation. We have Black Rose, which is an anarchist organization. We have the Brown Berets. The Brown Berets are a thing here again. We have La Raza Unida. We have many, many organizations that do this kind of a very similar model of collective um, political education. Um, so look, look around that for you uh, in your area. If you're African, contact us and we'll connect you to the chapter, APIP chapter closest to you. And then also, if there's nothing like that around you, if the APRP is maybe not for you, maybe you're just like kind of weary right now, by all means, you can start your own organization and develop your own work study process. All you really need to do is like come up with like a list of books and then recruit some friends to read them with you and talk about them. That's literally all you have to do. Just like say, I want to read about, I don't know, I want to read about indigenous people's history on Turtle Island. So me and a group of friends, we're going to read an indigenous people's history of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, and we're just going to talk about it. That's literally all you need to do. Like pick a book or even like a video or like an article, get a group together and talk about that shit. And bam, you got a study group. That's all you need to do. Definitely. And there's a comment uh, by Prudence saying, um, uh, Africans should understand by now the, colon um, the colonizers stay plotting and sabotaging 24 seven. They have never taken a day off ever, <laughs> ever, 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 ever. Correct. And so I, for me, um, like the political education and being in work study is so critical to my growth. And not just that, like I see how it impacts my son. You know, he was arguing with my auntie about 4th of July <laughs> and what it meant. But he could speak to what 4th of July meant. And it's because he's been listening during work study. Sometimes I also read with him. Um, so like for him to understand his own analysis because he's a kid. And so um, I think about like, to a kid, it's like, oh, there's firecrackers and what does it mean? What's the intent behind it? So we have to talk about that. So um, again, like if my son who's nine can be part of political education and learn and unlearn, mm -hmm. unlearn, unpack and work to understand more. He has a lot of questions. Of course, he's nine. Like we can also do that. And that's so critical to um, our development because um, that's how we organize. That's how we are going to be successful for our liberation. And I'm going to say that again. That is how we are going to be successful because we are. Word. And it doesn't, like, I am a college dropout. I went to this college for two years. I got my EMT license. And I was like, this is expensive and it sucks. And I dropped out. So I have like, no academic background whatsoever. Like, literally all that I know about revolution about my people's history came through the work study process of the African People's Revolutionary Party. Like the work study process develops what, what uh, revolutionaries call organic intellectuals, meaning people who are not like developed by the academy, people whose like analysis and knowledge and understanding is developed by the struggle and developed by collective engagement in this process to liberate our people. So I'm an example of that, of an organic intellectual. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times when we say study, when we say read, when we say like learn together, people's heads immediately go to like a, the academy, to academia, or to like, you know, these colonial ass schools that have like a particular model of learning. And I'm saying like, we don't, that's not what we're talking about. You do not have to have like a degree or any kind of clout in academia to do what we're talking about. All you need is a willingness to learn and struggle collectively over these ideas. Like, that's it. That's it. Yeah, we're not reading Eurocentric <laughs> like authors. <laughs> we're reading about our people who do this work, right? We're reading about our people who are aligned to our values. Um, and it builds critical consciousness. You know, we have to be conscious about what's happening around us, uh, what's happening around us um, in other countries as well that impacts uh, that impacts us. Like I'm just learning so much. Like I would have never known about AFRICOM if it wasn't for Onya Sawu bringing that into the space. And what that is, is um, it expanded uh, under Obama is um, there are um, military bases. So this country has military bases in Africa. So it's uh, 
53 of the countries, uh, 53, the military bases are in 53 of the 40, 54 countries. And what they're doing, and like drone strikes and extraction and harm, like Onya Sabu bought one reading, then I got it to read more, then I got to read more. And I'm like, damn, I didn't even know this existed and, um, and how this is continued exploitation uh, on our people and destruction. Like, I wonder how many people who are watching have heard about AFRICOM. Like, I didn't know till maybe like two months ago about AFRICOM. Um, and so hopefully we get to do a Pan-African film series, no, um, Pan-African Weekly News on AFRICOM uh, to create more and more awareness about what this country is doing. Um, as it, it's always, the United States is always focused on what other countries are doing to our people, but not what they're doing. Right. Um, that actually leads me to um, maybe like the last question I had, maybe the last two questions. So one question I had was, why did Africa moving towards independent economic independence threaten the West? The West meaning like Europe and the United States. Like why was that a threat, considered a threat to the interests of Western imperialism? And also a related question, why did, so like the United States government collaborating with the British overthrew the democratically elected uh, uh, presidency of Kwame Nkrumah? So like, why did they do that? Well, this whole entire global system depends on the richness, billions and billions of dollars from Africa. Everybody has a hand. Uh, and in our motherland and it's and so the threat that it um oh can you repeat the question again why did africa moving towards independent economic independence antagonize the west and then also why did imperialism move to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah? it it's a threat because it um allows us to invest in ourselves and um so ghana would have been this was the start and so if you have one uh, country rise up to have economic um, independence, then other countries in Africa get to see that as well and want to mobilize and organize to have that. And we can't have that because not we, this country cannot have that because um, um, things that are in our built with our iPhones come from there. Um, diamonds come from there. Chocolate comes from there. Like think about it, rubber. Firestone tires, like every so billions and billions are extracted. Um, Africa is not is not impoverished. Africa is not poor. Africa is the richest um, continent. And um, what it does is it it opens up the opportunity for Africa to gain its liberation and to gain its power back. And so this country could not have that, which is why we heard in the film around how cocoa went from like 100 to 80. I forgot, well, I don't know the, the necessarily the, the number matrix, but it was intentional because if you're able to um, um, harm their economic power, how else are they gonna, how else are they gonna thrive? Um, that's what I saw. But I think it's just about you, you continue to, um, you're not able, capitalism dies. Capitalism dies if uh, Africa gains economic independence. Yep, 100%. Like what Kwame Nkrumah and also what Pan-Africanism as a whole represents is Africans like complete, um, Africa's like complete disconnect from the system of capitalism. This capitalist global economy cannot function without the exploitation of Africa. The exploitation of Africa requires that the land resources and labor of the masses of African people not be under our control. What Kwame Nkrumah was putting forward, what Pan-Africanism says, is that we have the right to collectively control our land, labor, and resources. And we have the right to decide who is going to be able to have access to that land, labor, and resources, and on what terms. Once we define the terms of that deal, uh, the entire capitalist system crumbles because it can no longer depend on exploitation. So that's why when Kwame Nkrumah was like African, Africa for Africans, when Kwame Nkrumah was like one unified socialist Africa, when Pan-Africanists say that the wealth and labor and resources of Africa should be under the collective control of Africans, that is a direct threat to capitalism, a direct threat 
to imperialist powers like the United States who depend on the exploitation of Africa in order to sustain themselves. Without being able to like loot and destroy and exploit Africa and African people, this whole global capitalist system like falls apart. It crumbles. Africa is the key. And they understand that very clearly. And that is why they overthrew the government of Kwame Nkrumah. And then they went off, like, afterwards, after this, they were like, oh, he's a dictator. Oh, he was oppressing people. Oh, all these, like, lies. The same lies they tell about, like, Fidel Castro. The same lies they tell about Hugo Chavez. The same lies they tell about any revolutionary. They say the same shit over and over and over again. But when you look at what's actually happened, the fundamental issue is that all of these people, all of these movements that are described as threats in the West were really about taking away access from our shit, from this system, saying that we have the right to control our land, our labor, our resources. And that's what the problem is. It's not about dictatorship. It's not about democracy. It's about who gets to control the wealth, who gets to control the resources, who gets to control the land. That's it, that's it. And yet, Comrade um, Nkrumah Ture saying, yep, they tell those lies today, sis. The most recent time I can think of is, uh, what was that name? Evo Morales. Evo Morales in Bolivia, right? Who was an indigenous man that came to power, who was democratically elected, um, backed by a mass people's movement of mostly indigenous, poor and working class people in Bolivia. And the West was like, this is a dictator. This is a man oppressing his own people. Meanwhile, like, the masses of poor working class people in Bolivia were, were like, we love him. And then he was forced out by a literal fascist backed by the US government and by Western powers. And now that person is committing all kinds of like atrocities and barbarism to like put down the people's movement that rose up to put Evo Morales back in power. And the United States news, even though they were like all over the place talking about Evo Morales as a dictator, has nothing to say about this literal fascist. She is literally a fascist. That's how you can tell. Because the United States will openly work with, like, say, the, the, the monarchy in Saudi Arabia that, like, cuts off people's heads for being gay. But, like, Eva Morales, Vito Castro, Hugo Chavez, Kwame Nkrumah, can't work with them. We're, we'll, we'll work with, like, genocidal state of Israel. That's fine. But we won't, we, we won't work with, like, socialist countries? Like, it makes no sense. And the people here are taught not to question that. And we have to. We have to. And, and, it may, it, and, and it's all strategic. Because if they're working with socialist countries, then they know that um, people, people are able to see that capitalism is actually not working for us as a collective and that socialism is better. But, people, but if you keep a blinder there and people can't see that and they can't imagine it, right? They can't even imagine what it looks like to have free health care. They can't even imagine where during a pandemic your country cares for you and your death rate is not at 5%. <laughs> Like they can't even imagine that because that's all they see. Mm -hmm. um, but but then I also think about how it's like, well, well, what are we going to do? I have to have a house. I have to have a car. I have to have like all of that is like capitalistic that's ingrained in us. And it's like, well, what are other countries doing? What are other socialist countries doing? And they always choose like the far end. Um, and that's the other thing. Not every country that does socialisms are implementing the principles of socialisms like to its true values too so that's that's also something people have to see but of course they're not going to work with other socialist comfort uh, countries um this country thrives on capitalism 100 percent. the fundamental issue that this country has with socialism and anti-colonial movements is that it wants to have free access to exploit and steal and rape and loot and socialism and national liberation directly threaten the ability of the US and other imperialist powers to do that. And that is the fundamental issue. It's not because socialism doesn't work, because if that was the problem, they wouldn't have to attack it so hard. It's not that socialism produces dictators, because if that was the problem, then Cuba would not be by far more democratic than the United States. Venezuela would not be by far more democratic than the United States. The problem is that socialism puts the power in the hands of oppressed people and capitalism depends on disenfranchising oppressed people. That is the problem. That is the fundamental issue. That is why the United States government worked to overthrow and discredit Kwame Nkrumah. Cool. 
So it's like 4.16. We had this event scheduled to go to 4 o'clock. So maybe we should start wrapping it up. Um, any closing comments or thoughts, either from the audience or from Monica? I'm just trying to um, get, get back on and follow the comments to see if there was a comment to, to close us up. It's popping. It's popping in these comments. <laughs> lots of... Connie says, unlearning can be tough. However, it's so necessary, especially for our youth. Correct, Connie. And then DJ Brill responds, unlearning leads to the steps of African liberation. Like once we like, I feel like the process of collective political education is almost like an exorcism. Cause like you have all of this like, this like nonsense, like these lies that you internalize within like a capitalist and colonial and imperialist society. Like lies about who you are, lies about your people, lies about where we came from. And like the process of political education, at least in the APIP, has been like a like a, a like a seven year long process of like unlearning all the lies that I internalized. And I am very sure that's gonna continue for the rest of my life because it's almost like a constant assault of lies. Like if you turn on the TV, it's like a particular perspective that's being forced on you. If you open a book, a magazine and read, if you look at an ad on the bus, even if you like look at products in the store, it's like a particular perspective that's being forced on you. And what we are learning together in the APIP and any kind of revolutionary political education process and any kind of revolutionary you know, socialist organization is like intentionally undoing that constant messaging. Like the, uh, equipping you with the critical thinking skills to recognize it and like combat it before it even like hits your brain anymore. What else? So yeah, we appreciate y'all for all these comments. Um, yeah, Darren Mack is asking, thank you. This was powerful and look forward to more. Can you share the email to get connected? Absolutely. So to reach out to us, you can email AAPRP New Mexico at gmail.com. So if you are someone watching this that wants to learn more about the APRP, hit us up at that email, AAPRP New Mexico at gmail.com. Even if you're not in Tiwa territory, if you're interested in the APRP, we can connect you to other chapters, the one that's closest to you. Or we can answer any questions you might have about Pan Africanism or about the All African People's Revolutionary Party. So hit us up. Once again, that email is AAPRP New Mexico at gmail.com and this has been our monthly pan-african film series once again we do this series on the second saturday of every single month we've been doing it for two straight years and i don't think we've missed one it's actually incredible <laughs> we're so organized um <laughs> but so yeah this happens every single second saturday uh, it happens virtually so if you follow us on social media, which if you don't, please do. Um, but if you want to join us again next month on the second Saturday, uh, you can watch it again on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We're going to try this like Zoom registration thing again where folks can join us via Zoom. It, it worked out pretty well this time. And I'm trying to like stall so I can look up the next movie. <laughs> so, so Monica, you take over so I can open this. <laughs> um. Um, I, what's really um, making us think about this is uh, Onya Sabu talked about like we were in a high school before the, the pandemic. And so how when we get out of the pandemic, maybe in two years, who knows, because this country has no plan on how to save uh, lives. And so uh, having a hybrid of still being able to do it virtually as well as like in a, in a, in a space uh, because people have shared that they appreciate um, even our elders, right, who might want to um, watch it and not be able to um, get to the location or people who don't live in New Mexico being able to watch it. So it's been great. Every second Saturday at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard John. Correct. And the movie that we're going to show next month. So the film series next month is going to be Saturday, October 10th at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And the movie we're showing is actually really exciting. We're showing the Meteor Man. The Meteor Man by Robert Townsend. So yeah, it's like a, it's a African superhero that doesn't have neoliberal politics. Can you imagine that <laughs> has like, <laughs> like working class politics? That was um, direct shade to Black Panther. Direct, <laughs> direct shade to Black Panther. But we don't have to get into it. 
because I know a lot of people love that movie, and I'm not trying to end on like a hater note. <laughs> but um, yeah, don't end on a hater note. <laughs> <laughs> but the Meteor Man is like a really incredible movie because it's like a working class African superhero who organizes against gentrification. Like it's kind of lit. So I'm really excited that we're going to show that in October. So Saturday, October 10th. 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Join us for a screening and discussion of the Meteor Man. Also, if you are interested in joining the African People's Revolutionary Party, or if you would like more information, email us at apipnewmexico at gmail.com. We want to thank you so much for joining us and for all of your comments. We deeply appreciate y'all. Um, thank you so much for your interaction. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your weekend. Please... If you are not in an organization, join an organization, find out who's doing what in your area and get involved because we need all hands on deck to organize our people for liberation and also like frankly for survival as fascism is rising around the world. So please, if you're not in an organization, join an organization. If you're African and watching this, consider joining the African People's Revolutionary Party. Any, any last thoughts, Monica? No, I just wanted to say thank you all again also for joining us. Yep. Thanks, y'all. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.